So in this talk, I will look at how online research fits with the current challenges that we face in psychology, the accessibility of experiment creation tools, and set a vision and a challenge for the future. Hopefully, we're all aware of the replication crisis in psychology. The short version, to summarise, some seminal findings are not replicating. That's it, in a nutshell. This has been attributed to two broad causal factors. Small sample sizes of typically undergraduate psychology students. It turns out that psychology students aren't representative of the full diversity of humanity. Who knew? And secondly, pressure to salvage some value from the ashes of null results. And this has resulted in some questionable research practices. And I want to be completely clear here, post hoc analyses aren't a problem in themselves. It's absolutely fine once you've got a null result to dig into the data and see if there's something there that could be useful in the future. But it has to be transparently reported. And what happened was it wasn't always transparently reported. Various solutions have been proposed. The one which is the focus of today is taking behavioural research online. Thanks to companies like Prolific, who we'll hear from later today, you can now put a behavioural study, a reaction time study online, and collect enough data for a properly powered study from diverse participants, not undergraduate psychology students, over a lunch break. Wow! So, if it works, if that works, online science is good science, and it's good science for these reasons. You have a diverse, diverse participants, so your sample is no longer weird, large participant cohorts, so you're properly powered and you can have confidence in your results. You could reach specific populations, uh, so specific um, participant cohorts, which allow us to target niche, niche groups and answer much more interesting questions. So you could target deaf people, colorblind people, bilinguals, whatever, whatever it is you fancy, people with specific medical conditions. We can also run, run longitudinal studies with ease. Getting somebody to come into the lab every day for three months is just unrealistic. It's just not possible. Online, people taking part from home, this is totally doable. Longitudinal studies have gone from impossible to totally doable. This is very exciting. Since we spend more and more of our time online, shopping, banking, even socialising on Twitter, for some studies, the ecological validity is good. Now, for some participants, it can even be much better than coming into the lab. Coming into the lab is quite stressful for people. Um, a, whole load of, a whole load of effects might creep into your study. So the ecological validity is good. Now, this isn't to say that there isn't space for field trials and doing things face-to-face -face and doing things in more naturalistic environments, but, but there's space here for online research. So those are the gains. What are the, prerequis what are the other prerequisites for saying it works? We, we would need accurate timing and good data quality. Now, um, Nick Hodges, who's speaking after me, is going to talk about accurate timing, and Jenny Ward is going to talk about good data quality. Other things it needs to be is affordable, accessible, and transparent. So the problem with the current tools uh, is that creating experiments in code is often painful, frustrating, and time-consuming. We often speak to clients who are like, I just want those three months of my life back. It was hell. I never want to do it again. Please help me. And this painful, frustrating and time-consuming experience creates a barrier to entry and makes online experiments undemocratic. It's not available for everybody. If you can't code, this isn't something you can do. For better or for worse, coding is not for everyone. And you can have your own opinion about this, but worse still, and I think this is a bigger issue, experiments get constrained by technical ability rather than scientific need. And I want the science driving the science that's being done, not somebody's technical ability. So this was, a, this was our sort of call to, call to arms and we wanted to fix this. So addressing barrier to entry. We wanted to reduce the barrier to entry to online research. Setting up your own system is possible with a variety of open source components, but it takes several days, possibly even weeks or months, and you still need to procure a server which costs money. We wanted to minimize the barrier to entry as much as possible so that everyone can have a go. We wanted to make a tool that was available at any level of ability, whether you favor a point and click interface and you don't want to touch any coding whatsoever, it's not for you, or if you want to code in a modern IDE with proper version control. 
We wanted to increase transparency by making it easy for all levels of ability to see the settings of a task. No more indecipherable code that feels like a black box. And we wanted to create a modular, a modular authoring experience so that components could be reused in future studies without having to do complex surgery on the code base and therefore making us all more efficient. Let me just talk you through this slide a little bit because there's quite a lot of detail on there. So the grey nodes at the top and the bottom, those are the start and the finish nodes. Green nodes are questionnaires. That means we're not collecting uh, reaction time data and the blue nodes are from the task builder. That means that you are collecting reaction time data. So in this first study, the within subject design uh, with order control, oh yeah, the orange nodes are these things called control nodes. So what's happening there, you can read it quite simply. You get two questionnaires and that's your consent and then your demographics. And then we have two different tasks, an affect task and a relational reasoning task, controlled by a counterbalance node, which means that they come in a counterbalanced order. You just stick that node on and that all happens for you. Same components in the next one, we've got a between subject design by using the randomizer instead. So here we've just got the relational reasoning task. We've got the same two questionnaires the two relational reasoning tasks, and we've got the randomizer as the control node, pushing people in two different directions. And I think that's set up to do block randomization. Now use these two control nodes together, you can get an intervention design. So you've got, it's the same components again, we haven't written any new code here, haven't written any new tasks or any no, new content, we're just sticking it together in a different order. You've got your two questionnaires, now I have a pre-test, which is the affect, uh, questionnaire. I've then got my randomizer to two conditions, two different versions of the relational reasoning task, and then at the end I've got the affect test again, which has now got an order counterbalance on. So that's a traditional interventional design. So that's what I mean by a modular approach. The component approach has two benefits. It's much easier for your own lab to run variations on a theme. Uh, your PhD student could create one task, and then you could use this in lots of different ways, maybe with different stimuli, maybe in different experimental designs again and again and again, very easily. It's also easier for other labs to do the same. They could get in touch and say, oh, I'd really like to use this task that you used within that experiment, and you can just send it to them. We wanted to provide powerful nodes that make complex experiments designs as easy as simple ones. In this slide, you can see uh, repeat and delay nodes being used to set up a five-day longitudinal study with email reminders. So in the first one, you've got the questionnaire, then we get the repeat node, and then there's uh, the task, and then a delay node, and then we hit the second bit of the repeat node that sends you back five times. So it's literally, you're just linking this together, and Gorilla will do all of the daily reminders. You set how long you want on the delay node. Is it, is it an hour? Is it a day? Is it a week? And that will all happen automatically. The second one is a task switching paradigm. We've got this concept of a switch node where participants can switch to a secondary task uh, either one or many times and you can set whether you want people to complete the content of one or both tasks or whether you want people to be in that task for a duration. So you could say I want people to spend 20 minutes in this section, they can move backwards and forwards between the two tasks as many times as you want and you could look at uh, questions of like um, diligence or you could set it up differently to answer a different research question. But all that's done just by adding a switch node. And the last one is a counterbalance node, which is a way of setting up uh, sort of like hundreds of different stimuli decks that you can hand out to different participants so that you cover a large, large range of stimuli. But all of that is taken, part, taken care of uh, in, with these control nodes. Speed. We wanted to provide tools that make us more efficient. We're all so time pressured. I don't know anybody who doesn't say, I'm so busy at the moment. Uh, so we wanted to make everyone more efficient so that research, researchers and students can spend more time thinking about the experimental design, uh, thinking about the literature and, the, and then the data analysis and less time doing the implementation of a task and the coding. Um, if you've got better tools, you can just set it up far faster. Accessibility. Now this is really important. I'd, I'd love to create a system which is completely fully tooled and ours is going to get better and better and better, but cutting edge science sometimes requires something that has never been done before. And so we wanted to make the GUI, our graphical user interface, that was easily extensible by adding the minimum code necessary to get the job done. We didn't want to offer the version where you build in the tooled environment and then you press a button and that converts it to code and then you tweak it. Because then if you get stuck and you go, well, actually, I want to go back and make a change over here, 
you can't go back in the other direction. So you either go back to an earlier version, make the change and convert it and then do it all over again, or you start digging into the code. So what we've got, um, what we wanted to do is that you had the, the GUI and the code side by side um, so that you can always use either environment to do what you want. Reproducibility. We wanted to make it super easy to collaborate with other researchers and to send files to researchers that want to do a replication. I'm sure many of us have had the experience of trying to collate all the files needed to run a task and get it all together to send to colleagues. Um, and there always seems to be a file missing or you've got a version mismatch in your software. Nice thing with cloud software is that never happens. Um, and we wanted to make, yeah, collaborating and sending take just a few mouse clicks and Gorilla, you just go collaborate which means somebody can have access to the same thing and you can control data and access rights or just um, send it to them and then they get a copy and then they can do with that as they please. We have plans to extend this functionality soon, so hopefully later this year there'll be an announcement, so watch this space. So these are the ideas that shaped Gorilla uh, and it's our do-it-yourself tool for creating online experiments. We think Gorilla allows everyone to do good online science. But why stop at good science? What about great science? Great science means fixing real world problems. Insights from the behavioral sciences have the potential to address some of the biggest problems affecting society today. To name just a few, obesity, smoking, drinking, literacy, numeracy, recycling, poor mental health, tax evasion, pensions, climate change. These all have behavioral solutions. Fixing any of these is a worthy goal. So that's what we've been doing via Cauldron. We've been helping visionary researchers bring their experiments to life. Fun Maths and Star are both educational games. Fun Maths belongs to Diana Lorillard and Brian Butterworth and covers addition and subtraction and is in a clinical trial at the moment. So hopefully we'll get them to come and talk next year to talk about that. Um, and Star is a game to teach deaf children to read and Mairead uh, will talk about Star later. Games like these have the potential to transform education. They provide specialist, evidence-tested and validated tuition to those that need it. Um, lastly, the DECAL portal uh, provides speech and language therapists with specialist tasks for deaf, deaf patients. Uh, so these are specialist tasks and assessments to help with diagnosis of conditions and sort of level of ability. Mairead will talk about this later too. And we're currently working with a couple of other uh, portals to provide assessments and interventions for different conditions. But we're just a small company. How can we accelerate the pace of getting research out of the lab and into the real world? By equipping current students with the skills needed to create and validate interventions themselves. Some of you will continue to have impact as academics, but others will leave academia. No, it's a surprise. Some of you will want to leave. Um, you might end up in industry uh, or in policy or with a startup wishing to address one of the problems on the previous slide. If you can take digital, experiment digital experimentation skills to other industries alongside experimental design, psychological knowledge, data analysis, and your project management skills, you'll, you'll be ideally placed to have impact. Here's one vision of what might happen next. Policymakers will want to test, learn and adapt public policy so that it is continually improved. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Civil servants will be able to test solutions to nudge socially constructive behaviour. Therapists will be able to create assessments and interventions for their clients. Health professionals will be able to collect behavioural data remotely and provide better care. And teachers will be able to create and use adaptive learning games to complement traditional education. So regardless of whether you are in academia or in another industry, we have to be able to get to the point where we can say, this works. We should do this in schools. We should do this in surgeries. We should do this in society. It will take careful validation to get there. We don't want to create digital homeopathy or worse still, digital snake oil. But once, once the validation is done, we need to find a way to roll out interventions that will change lives. And the internet is the perfect delivery mechanism. It's available anywhere on any device. User data can be collected continually to enable further research and to guide further improvements. And updates can be rolled out almost instantaneously to everybody. We imagine a future where digital interventions that make people's lives better can be 
Built, tested, deployed and updated, quickly, cheaply and easily. We aren't there yet, but that's our mission.